Put your hands together and help me welcome those who are joining us in Bell Chase and online. We're so glad we have family meeting in multiple locations as one church. If I haven't had the pleasure to meet you, my name is Pastor Danny. I serve as our campus pastor over at the great campus of Bell Chase. Come on, Bell Chase, shout me out. Come on now. And they just went wild over there, I know, I know, I know. Well, I have the honor and privilege of bringing to, to you today part four, wrapping up our help series. And this is a fun series because it's standalone messages that you asked for during Easter. And so Pastor Josh has brought some incredible, incredible thoughts. And I love, absolutely love our topic today. It's actually something I'm personally really fired up about right now. And so I want to dive into that. But before we do... Let's recap a little, bit, a little bit of where we have been. Week one, we talked about help. I'm new to this family. And I like to say to this crazy family. If you haven't looked to your left or right, they got some crazies up in here. And you might be one of them. Week two, we talked about help. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Can I get a show of hands if you have felt overwhelmed at least one time this week? There you go. Week three, help. I'm worried about money. In our economy, in our day and age, this is something that can be heavy on us at any given time. And the scary thing is it can sneak up on you before you realize it. You're worried and fearful about money. If any of those three topics really strike a chord with you, I, I, we have those available on our website, onehopechurch.com. All of our messages are archived. You can go back and listen to a great message on those. But today, I want to talk about help. I'm feeling unfulfilled. I'm feeling unfulfilled. I want to get into our opening verse, and then we're going to pray. Psalms 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word that is going to shine light and revelation in this area, God of needing to feel fulfilled, to make a difference with my life. God, I'm praying for every eye, every heart to be opened to what you have to say to us today. And it's in your precious, mighty name we pray. If you would, say a big amen with me. Well, if you're here for the first time, you picked a great Sunday. This is an incredible topic because you're about to find out the what behind what makes this, or at least what I think, makes this an incredible, great church to be a part of. This is one of the most critical messages that I could share. And really because this is uh, true to my personal story. I grew up in church. Uh, my parents were the first in both sides of the family to, to, to become a Christian. And so all I knew was 1,000 miles per hour, 100% serving in church. That's all we did. I, I met friends on the baseball team and was like, you don't go to church on Sunday? You don't go to church three times on Sunday? You don't go to Monday night prayer on Monday? You don't do Wednesday night service? You don't do students um, on Friday night? I was like, what kind of life are you living? <laughs> Everything was church, 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 church. And we didn't just attend church, we served church. I was behind, the, I was in back rooms, running controls, running cameras, sound on worship teams, setting stuff up. From like the age 10, 11, I was fully engaged and just thought this was normal. Well, come to find out you grow up, you start a family, and you're like, why is this unsustainable? Why am I, why am I feeling, and the word is, burned out? And maybe you're in the room today and you've been a part of a great church environment, but you just hit a place where you just became burned out. And so this place of unfulfilled is connected to what some of you experience as burnout. And what I realized later on is that when we start, my wife and I, when we started a church over in West Wego, uh, I had to find, I had to find really what mattered for me, what was making a difference in other people's lives, and how could I focus in those areas. So if this is you, you hit the right Sunday because we're going to get it right. We're going to get it right. And if you get it right, here's what will happen. I can promise you two things. You will experience personal fulfillment like you've never dreamed. I know it's a big promise, but I promise at the end of the day, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. And B, we are going to collectively make an eternal difference. 
And that's really my hope today, is that you will start on a life of personal fulfillment in Christ, and we together will make a bigger difference in our city, in our community, than we've ever had before. If you struggle with feelings of unfulfillment, and you have not dipped your toes in the waters of a serve team, I hope to talk a little bit about that and maybe help you with that. You know, in just a, this moment right here, if you are on a serve team, can we just applaud you and thank you for cre- helping us create such an amazing experience? From our parking team to our ushers to our kids and our hospitality and our prayer team and our worship team, it is all happening and it is what makes One Hope so great. But if you haven't stepped in to a serve opportunity, if you've never considered that, I want to maybe talk about three reasons why. Number one is maybe we do such a good job you didn't know that there was a need. Well, I'm about to clear that up for you. We prefer to talk about vision over need. Can everybody say vision? You did a good job. Thank you. We prefer to share vision over need. I wrote a few thoughts here. And if you, if you want to take some notes, there's a message note card right in the seat back in front of you. All of the, the best church attenders do this practice right here. They take out a, and they, they do that. Belchase does it every Sunday, <laughs> both services. <laughs> but here's, here's a thought on why we share vision over need. If I am primarily moved by need, I will eventually deplete. And let that sink in for a minute. If I am always moved by need, there's going to come to a point where my resources, as Pastor Josh has shared, my time, my talent, and my treasure will deplete. Proverbs 19.4, not on the screen, will say, help, wealth Wealth attracts friends, but the closest friend of the poor deserts them. Why? Because need will always deplete resource. Our, because in our strength, need always exceeds or outlasts those resources. Let me say it this way. Uh, I'm a football fan. Actually, I'm an all-around sports fan. And one thing you'll notice as the draft is coming up, well, actually, it's, it's started already. Teams are trying to fill positions of Need. Thank you. And we all know, saints, we have a lot of needs right now. But that's okay. We're going to fill them all in the name of Jesus. Um, But the best players, they go to a team for two reasons. Either a lot of money or because the team has vision for winning a championship. A great player doesn't go to a team just because there's a need. There's always a need. But where there is vision, you will attract the greatest talent because the best players want to be on a team that has vision for winning a championship. Does that make sense? And let me just tell you, bring it back home, One Hope has vision for winning championships. We have vision for seeing the lost saved, revival in our city. We, we, We have vision for people coming into a community and not feeling alone and getting a part of becoming a part of a family. Just this year alone, we've seen over 90 people make a decision for Jesus. That is powerful and amazing. Also, need feels like pressure. But vision feels like opportunity. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to be moved not by pressure, but because an amazing opportunity has become available. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 reminds us this, that each of you should give what you have already already decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion or under pressure because God loves a cheerful giver. So maybe you didn't know there was any needs. Well, that's because we talk more vision than need. Number two, maybe you're just an American. Do we have any Americans in the room? And why do I say that? Because Americans love their God-given freedom. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. If you, if you want me to do something, we have, we have a, a, an unspoken rule around here to uh, ask in a telling tone. Because asking gets more a better response from someone than telling them you want them to do something. That's all of our goal, isn't it? 
We, we try to work our way up to retirement so the boss can't tell us what to do anymore. We tell ourselves what we're going to do with our time. The problem for most in serving is that they feel like somebody else may have their claws in our time. And I want to tell you that One Hope undoubtedly tries to put that calendar back into your hands. You know, we call it a serve one, worship one. A serve one week, worship one week. I love that I have some team members over at Bell Chase that they're, 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 they're served as once a month. Why? Because the other three, they're either spending with their family or they're out of town. You know, we put the calendar back into your hands so that you don't feel like somebody's claws are always scraping for your time. We want you to love church. And how do you love Sundays? It's because you want to be here, not because you have to be here. And that's a big difference. So when it comes to serving and making a difference, we want you to want to serve, not have to serve. Okay, so I gave you two. I'm going to give you one more reason. Maybe you feel like, well, I've done that before. I've done this stuff before. I've done the serve thing. Well, like I shared in my personal story, i had done a lot of serving before. I've been on mission trips when I was 11 and 12 years old, helped build churches uh, as much as an 11 or 12-year-old can do. Usually, I was, if I go back, I was probably getting in the way more than I was helping, but I was there. I was present. We've done all sorts of different ministry and serve opportunities, but I, get, I can tell you today, I get to do what I do now. I don't do it because I have to. I don't do it because it's the biggest paycheck. I do it because it is what I was called to do. Maybe you've heard that passionate plea for help. Um, maybe you've made that commitment to help somebody, and it ended up being painful. And I thought of a fun illustration for this, and I need a little participation in the room. And it's just simply this. Simply this. Raise your hand if you own a truck. Go ahead. If you own a pickup truck, come on, raise it nice and proud. Ford, Chevy, Dodge, all of them. Come on, raise it up high. You see, that is so... Bell Chase, go ahead. You all own trucks in Bell Chase. I know that. <laughs> Lift kits, big knobby tires, I, the, whole, the whole thing. And the reason why that felt really awkward is because now someone knows you own a truck. <laughs> and when you own a truck, you get asked to help out to move things. And it's not because you want to. It's because you feel pressured to. Because you have a gift, a talent, a treasure. It's no fun to use it out of pressure because there's a need. It's more fun to do it because there's vision and opportunity and you get to do it. So when I ask you to get involved, maybe you're going to say, well, that's your job. You're the preacher. You're supposed to ask me to get involved. I'm telling you on the other side is I get to do this. And it is a pleasure and a joy for me to get up and share and lead teams. I love to do what I do. So let me take the pressure off, though. At the end of the day, if you say, good job, uh, you preached a great message, I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm good work right where I am. You just need to know the kingdom of God is going to be okay. <laughs> it is not hinged upon your involvement. It's just that we would be better if we did it together. And I hope to convince you, convince you of that today, that we would be better together, really for two reasons. You can jot these two down. Number one is, you will be better with us. I know that sounds a little uh, boastful, but I promise you, you're going to be better with us because we all need to be on a good team. Who doesn't want to be on a winning team? I'd love to be on a winning team. I know Little League uh, softball and baseball just kicked off, and you hope you're on a winning team. It's no fun to be on the the team that everybody else wants to play. Right? Let's see if we can 10-run rule this team. You know, nobody wants to be on that team. Actually, kids usually quit that team, and then they pop up on the winning team. I don't know how they do that, but somehow they make that work. But you'll be better with us. And number two, we will be better with you. We'll be better with you. The vision that our church has for our city. And it's so exciting that I get to be a part of launching the first campus from One Hope outside of our New Orleans base. And that is exciting that Pastor Josh and our team here have vision for expanding. It's not just how many people can we cram into this Gentilly Paris Avenue space, but we want to bring the gospel to other parts of our city. And that's going to take partnership. That's going to take us walking with vision together. 
90 plus people committed their life to Christ. This year alone, just this past Friday, we had four freedom groups, guys. If you were a part of a freedom group, I applaud you. 12 weeks of commitment to that group. We had a men's and a women's over here in the, in the New Orleans area. And we had a men's and a women's over on the West Bank. And we joined up. We converged here on Friday night with about 24, 25 adults praising God, getting deliverance, having hands laid on us to receive the Holy Spirit, and lives walked out of here changed. So much happens outside of a Sunday that maybe you're not even aware of because we have vision for reaching the city. Number one, you'll do better because you were made for this. You're never going to feel fulfilled in life until first you connect with God. And why is it important to connect with God? Because he has the book on your life. If you would turn with me to Psalms 139, David writes and says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How wise and how confident David is. Why? Because his purpose and his calling and his identity and his ap the, his, the affirmation was not wrapped into an outward appearance. Did you catch that? He said it multiple times that God knit him before anyone ever saw him. The design was created in shape before the outward appearance was ever created. And I promise you, others around will look at your outside appearance and try to tell you and define you, but God has already defined you, and it is written deep inside of you. And it takes wisdom, it takes time, it takes understanding to allow that design that is in you to come up and out and serve its purpose. I love David's confidence. He understood. And then he ordered his life around, I've heard Pastor Josh say this multiple times, the E-R-O-I, the eternal reward on investment. David knew what was going to matter for eternity, and he ordered his life around it. The second reason is we'll do better with you. It's true. We're all part of God's master plan. God's got something for us to do together. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, for we, can everybody say we? We are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The happiest people that I know are connected to God's plan and connected with others who are connected to that plan. I thought of it this way. God's plan helps us with structure and design. And working with others helps us with compassion and empathy. And I'm sure you know somebody that could use a little help in either side. And that is what, one of the reasons why it works so much better for us to walk this plan out together. Most Christians don't see themselves, however, as special. They don't see themselves through God's perspective. Second Corinthians, Paul reminds the church, these are not in your notes. He says, unfortunately, you are measuring and comparing yourself by others. And he says, and that's why you're feeling unfulfilled. You're not challenging yourself based on how God designed you. You're challenging yourself based on what others are able to accomplish based on their design. But instead, in 1 Peter 2.9, in your notes, it says this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You probably read over that way too quickly. And if you would slow down, you would say, a priest? What? Me? A priest? Yes. You have been chosen by God. If you have said yes to Jesus, you're chosen. And if you are chosen, he says, I want to set you in this long lineage of priests. You're royalty. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. You have been called for a royal purpose. 
Now, that does not mean perfect. It does mean with a purpose. God has not called us with the standard of perfection. He's called us to live to a standard of purpose. He has designed you with that. So why? Because priests declare things. You know, if, if you flip into your Old Testament part of your Bible, you're going to see the priests are always sharing the Word of God. They're going through scrolls and they're declaring the Word. He has purposed you, your life, to declare something. Now that's where the freedom comes in because what will your life declare? What will your light shine is up to you and God. So why is it that we don't see ourselves as priests? Let me take you really briefly through some church biblical history. In your Old Testament, God's Spirit worked through priests. These were special people with a connection to God. Then in the New Testament, we go from B.C. to A.D., Jesus is on the scene. And what does Jesus do? Jesus looks at ordinary people and he says, you are now the lights of the world. You. You. He takes ordinary people. I love that because now I'm just, I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm one of these. Jesus could have walked in the scene. It could have been me. And he was like, you are now going to be the light of the world. Me? No, I'm just Dan. You know, I thought you don't know me. You're like, you're the guy. You're the girl. You're the mom. You're the dad. You are the one I'm calling. You are going to be my witness. Come on. That's powerful. You are all priests. As Pastor Josh says, he took, Jesus came and took the cookies off the top shelf and he put them on the bottom shelf for all of us. Actually, Pastor Josh changed it around. He says, I'm taking a steak off the top shelf and I'm putting it on the bottom shelf so everybody can eat steak, you know, because that's, you know. So that was the Old Testament, then the New Testament. Well, then one day, there was the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, you can write that down for some extra reading. The Spirit of God settled on all of them in that room and the message became very clear that God wants not only to have relationship, but he wants you to have power in this life to do what he's asked you to do. So he took ordinary people, you and me, he called them, and then he gave them power. But unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> right then, after Jesus' life, just like the Old Testament priests... The Christian leaders decided to hire a few people to do all the work, and there we began clergy and laity. The clergy ran the show while the laity put the tithe in the bucket and listened to those who were preaching. In other words, a group of people did all the work, and the rest sat passively in the pews and watched the show. You know that's not God's plan. That never was. Then in the 1500s, there was a Protestant Reformation. This was a resurgence of religious freedoms, individual dignity. And the spiritual authority was then relocated back to scriptures. And what they found was there's a priesthood of believers. But what didn't really change even after the Protestant Re Reformation is that there were still two groups of Christians, clergy and laymen. There were still two groups. And today, unfortunately, that is the way a lot of people still view church. They have the role of the preacher. That's the preacher's job. That's what the preacher's supposed to do. The preacher's supposed to go visit people in a hospital. The preacher's going to preach all, and teach all the Bible studies. The preacher's going to... How many of you know the Bible says the pastor's supposed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry? We were all called to do the stuff. Not just a select few. There's no, there's no biblical support for that structure. Instead, there's tons of evidence in Scripture that he wanted to take ordinary people and make them priests. And this is why One Hope started the way it did. I love that it didn't take long for us to join One Hope and we experienced the extraordinary power of a team that operates based on design. I wanted to take a second to just recap, if you don't know, a little bit of our story in 2019... It's when I met Pastor Josh. Um, my wife and I, we were pastoring since 2011 in West Wego. We led a great church. My father had started it and founded it in 98. And so we had taken over in 2011. And we had hit some hurdles as a church that we were just struggling to overcome. And in 2019, I met Pastor Josh. And him and I were on our way to a, a pastor's meeting in Gonzales. And we began to talk 
vision. We began to talk church life, family life, life stories. And in that conversation, God spoke some things into my spirit that I went home and shared with my wife what I thought I'd never talk about. And that is, I think Pastor Josh and I are going to do this together. (laughs) I think somehow we're going to do, our church is going to do church with One Hope. And she was like, what is wrong with you? She was like, what are you, crazy? Like, that's not what we've been working towards. And I said, I just think there's something that God wants us to do together. And we get, began to pray and fast. And by the end of that year, our church in West Rigo became a part of and was adopted by One Hope. And it didn't take long for me to see what he was talking about. And my favorite person in One Hope is Ms. Jackie McDonald. And I met her at an ARC meetup. And I, as soon as I saw Ms. Jackie, I said, Ah, now I know why One Hope is so special because they have a Miss Jackie right here. And if you don't know Miss Jackie, you don't know what I'm talking about. But I knew I was in good hands as soon as I saw Miss Jackie. And I said, you know, God is going to do something special here with us in One Hope. And I knew that everything was going to work out. It was an amazing, amazing year for us. Um, In a short period of time, I learned some of those particulars of principles that our serve team here was based upon. And that is there are no volunteers. I said it, and that's probably the only time I can get away with saying that word. That is not a good word here. We don't do that. What we do is we serve. We don't look for volunteers. We look for family members, those who want to be a part of the family. And church shouldn't just look like Pastor Josh. Thank God, because I've tried, and I am never going to fill this shirt like Pastor Josh would fill his shirts. We look at him on that screen from Bell Chase, and I'm like, man, he's filling that shirt. Nice, man. Oh. <laughs> the lighting is real good. And we never want to put someone in a position to serve where they're not gifted. We want people to do, and maybe you have a t-shirt that says, I was made for this. Um, that's really what the, that's really the mantra behind it. What are you made for? And we want to set you loose to do just that. Let me s- maybe spin it this way just a little bit. Uh, go down this rabbit trail with me. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, there was a psychologist named M- M- um, Maslow, and he, and he designed and created and studied this thing, and he, and, he, and he formulated this thing called the hierarchy of needs. And I don't know if you've heard of that. But what he was basically saying is that in this study of achieving fulfillment, he noticed these layers of needs that needed to be met. And at the bottom layer were these physiological needs. Needs of food, water, warmth, and rest. And once you had those ironed out, once somebody had those figured out, then on top of that were needs of security and safety. We needed to feel secure. We needed to feel safe. And then on top of those needs were the needs of belonging. These were needs of love and affirmation. Next were needs of esteem. The feeling of accomplishment that I've done something. And there the study rested for a number of years. And if you dig into Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll realize that this was an ongoing process. He was from a psychological standpoint, learning God's plan for us that ultimately to reach fulfillment, there was a need for self. He called it self-actualization, which was defined as achieving one's full potential. And that was necessary for achieving personal fulfillment. So if you want to know what serving on a team here is all about, it's about you discovering your purpose, your calling, your talent, your treasure, and making a difference in somebody else's life with that. So even though, even though you may have as many problems as the next, or you may be as busy, or maybe you look left to right and like, I don't know how you do all the things you do. We often get asked, if you didn't know, we have seven children, and we have sports, and we have music, and we have church. And sometimes we look at each other and go, I don't know how we're going to do this. And I'm like, what in our life isn't making an eternal difference? And let's cut there. Let's start there. Because it's usually when you're running full speed, when you're running those race cars running down that, that track, they have to run optimally tuned. 
And if there's one thing in that system that's pulling against, those mechanics have to get in and find that thing that's in the way of achieving the goal of that race team. And Paul said, it, we're running a race. And I want to run with endurance. I want to reach the finish line with my, with my head screwed on straight. <laughs> I want to reach the finish line and hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And that's going to take continual effort. And what is it in my life that I've allowed to come into my calendar, my schedule, taking my energy, that is not making an eternal difference? And can I cut that out? Why? So that I can run my race. John 15, on the screen it says this, This is to my Father's glory that you, maybe make that personal, that I would bear much fruit. Showing yourself to be my disciple. Verse 11, he says, I have told you this so that my joy in you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. They received the greatest gift ever. They discovered what they were meant to do. As we begin to close, I want to give you three things that you can walk away with. Three ideas that if you commit these to your heart, if you commit that I'm going to make some changes based on these three ideas, I think you're going to leave here convinced that you can live a life with, of fulfillment. That you can live a life that's designed and orchestrated and ordered around your purpose. And the enemy cannot stand against that. Number one is this, that God made you special. God made you special. You're not an accident. You weren't born and then you just have to go figure things out. God made you special. And your speciality, your specialness, the things that make you you are needed in God's kingdom. You don't have to be like somebody else. We already have that one. We need you. Your gifts are needed. We can live without it, but why? Why? When we can do this together. Remember, you're a priest. We say it around here like this. You're a 10. You're a 10. Maybe not on the worship team, but you're a 10 in some area. <laughs> you got to love those that give it a shot, though. I mean, it's, you, it's good. Come to worship development like, oh, good four and a half maybe. But you're a 10 in some area. Let's go try this again. And it's okay. We can do that together. There's no pressure. What are you passionate about? Come through step two. That's what in the step two, even today, step two, next steps is all about helping you discover your purpose, your gifts. We do a spiritual gifts assessment. Why? So that you can see something about yourself maybe you never saw before. And how you naturally go about doing that thing is usually wrapped up in your personality. Whether you're extroverted or whether you're introverted, you all have leadership. Your gift is special. We would be better together. In Psalms 139, verse 13, we read it a little bit earlier, but let me remind you, you were created, he created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb, God made me special. Number two, is God qualified you. That's an important word, he qualified you. To which degree are you affirmed or accepted by God? You need to dig into his acceptance because he's the one that qualifies. I can't qualify you. You shouldn't look for qualification from a peer. You know who qualified your gifts, your talent, your calling, your turn? It's God. God qualified you. He qualifies the called. He doesn't call the qualified. You aren't perfect and you don't have to be to make a difference. I love that just recently I received a couple of messages from some people serving on our team. And I just wanted to share these, these thoughts anonymously. One said, I'm so thankful and I feel blessed that God chose me. In such a short time, my whole family has grown to love yours and one hope so much. It's truly an honor and a blessing to serve. Another message said, there was a time when sitting through three services would have been a begrudging experience for me. 
Some of you are like, three services? That sounds terrible. It's okay. One hopes excellence and relentless pursuit of an experience with God has renewed a vigor in me and my family. It has given us an endearing sense of what it means to love and pursue a relationship with God. But thank you all for being so sensitive to what God wants to accomplish. It is an honor to serve with everyone at One Hope. Those are real stories, real text messages, real emails. And accepting Jesus is simply allowing His perfect, His perfection to invade our imperfect. That's powerful. Because God specializes in using those that others overlook. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. Again, it says, but you are a chosen. Could you say that with me? Say chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people belonging to God. God qualifies us. Lastly, God's purposes fulfills personal emptiness. One hope is an amazing place. Just as it is. It's an amazing experience, full of amazing families, amazing people serving on the team. But you know, the vision is much bigger than that. The dream is much bigger than that. The dream is for every one of us to grow together in relationship in a small group. The vision and the dream is for every one of us to serve together and make a difference in our city. It reminded me of Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. There was a story of a young lady who was sitting on the front row and she told of when she saw those blue signs and one day she decided to come and and she left us this message some years ago. She said, I appreciated the delivery of the message. It's a truly godly woman right there. Because it definitely didn't sound like a suggestion, but it was the exact push that I needed. Though I checked the boxes for the kids' team and served Saturday, I still didn't think anything of it until that very next day, I got an email from both team leaders inviting me to volunteer for the very next Sunday for kids and the next sat- Surf Saturday. God couldn't have been more clear about where He wanted me to be. And now I'm in a church community that I've never had before. That was Tonya's story. My question today is, what is your story? What story is God writing through His design, His purposes, the gifts and the callings that He has specifically and specially in you? It's for us to discover. What would it be like if we focused not on our emptiness, but we focused on our fulfillment. What would it be if I passed the mic around and just started to and started giving people the opportunity to share stories of what's God doing in you and what has God done in your life and what has church meant to you and what has your small group meant to you and what was small groups like for you when you first experienced the relationships and the friendships where people knew your name and you mattered to someone. I can only imagine what God thinks about when he looks down at church and he sees, as the word says, the brethren dwelling together in unity, accomplishing and fulfilling the purposes that he has for us. Rather than complaints, we have conversations about purpose. We want to see souls saved. We want to see lives changed. We want to see people living up to their full potential Filling their purpose in life. And if you're today here today, whether watching online or watching from our other campus, or you're here today in the room, and maybe the idea of living a fulfilled life seems so far unreachable, how dare I even mention? Maybe you've been living 10, 15, 20, 40 years on an up and down roller coaster feeling like it's just right there to grasp and then it's out of your hands reach but I want to what I want to mention to you today and make very clear is it begins with a relationship with Jesus 
through relationship with Jesus, you begin to discover your purpose. And so if that's you today, and you say, I need to begin that relationship with Jesus. I need to say yes to him. I've heard about him. Maybe you've walked with him some years ago, and you say, today I need to recommit. I need to say yes to him today. Because I want to know what my purpose is. If you would, all around our room and bell chasing online, why don't you just take a second with me, bow your head. And close your eyes and let's have, a, let's have a conversation with him. And if that's you and you say, I want to pray with you today, Pastor Danny. I want to pray with you today. I want to say yes to Jesus. Maybe just say a prayer just like this after me. Say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. I'm asking you to be my Lord and Savior. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you forgive me of trying to live my life my own way? Would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life?